Hello and welcome back everyone. So this is going to be our last part in the endonautic microbiology series. Uh, in this lecture, we'll be going through the different types of endonautic infections. So the endodontic infections are usually classified according to the anatomical location as either being intraradicular or extraradicular. The intraradicular infections being those infections that occur within the pulp and the extraradicular infections being those infections that occur outside the pulp, mostly around the apical regions of the tooth. The intraradicular infections are further classified into three categories as primary infections, secondary infections, and persistent infections. And it is important to learn about these individual infections in order to successfully eradicate them. So first let's start with the primary infections. So when a group of microorganisms initially gain access to the pulp and cause necrosis of the pulp and finally establish an infection, then this type of infection will be known as the primary intraradicular infection. So this is the most basic form of endodontic infection. If you don't know how a microorganism establishes an infection, I recommend you to watch my previous lecture, the Endodontic Microbiology Part 2, in which I have discussed in detail how a bacteria establishes an infection in the pulp. So let's talk more about the type of bacteria found in the primary infection. Now there is usually a mixture of bacterial species present in the primary infections, including those that are responsible for causing the initial pulpal inflammation, those that may join in the later stages of the inflammation or the primary infection may also have those bacteria that take advantage of an already necrosed pulp to attack and colonize the necrotic pulp. This is because the pulp now has been exposed to the oral cavity and different bacteria can join later onwards during the infectious process. And because of these different varieties of bacteria, a polymicrobial nature of microorganism is found in the primary endodontic infection and hence diverse group of bacteria are present in the primary infections. But among these diverse group of bacteria, obligate anaerobic bacteria seem to be quite dominant. Remember that there are two main groups of bacteria if we classify them according to the need of oxygen for their division. One are the aerobic bacteria that require oxygen for their division and the other are the anaerobic bacteria that don't require oxygen for their division. And then there are subdivisions of these types like the obligate anaerobic bacteria that die in the presence of oxygen and obligate aerobic bacteria that die in the absence of oxygen. Of course there are other subdivisions as well like the facultative bacteria but let's keep that topic for some other lecture. So as I've already mentioned, obligate anaerobic bacteria appear to be the most common bacteria in the primary anaerobic infection. The reason why these type of bacteria are the most common while the other types are not as common is because there are certain factors that influences the bacterial growth and their composition. These key factors are the oxygen tension, redox potential, type and amount of nutrients available and bacteria to bacteria interaction. Let me explain how all of this ties in. So when an endodontic infection starts, facultative bacteria dominate the initial phase of infection. After a few days or weeks, oxygen gets depleted in the root canal system because of two main reasons. First, as we have studied in the previous lectures, the initial attack from the facultative bacteria progresses the pulp towards its necrosis, hence cutting the supply of oxygen to the pulp. And secondly, the remaining oxygen stores in the necrotic pulp are consumed and eventually exhausted by the facultative bacteria that have initially invaded the pulp. As a result, an oxygen depleted environment or an anaerobic environment develops and with subsequent low redox potential. This low oxygen environment is highly favorable for the growth of obligate anaerobic bacteria and hence their growth starts in the infectious pulp. With the passage of time, this anaerobic conditions become even more pronounced, especially in the apical region because that region is the farthest away from the oral cavity. And as a result, the anaerobic bacteria start to show domination, eventually outnumbering the facultative bacteria. And finally, this is how obligate anaerobes become the most common species of bacteria in the primary anaerobic infection. Now this classification of bacteria was according to the need of oxygen for their division. If we talk about the other more commonly used classification of bacteria which is also discussed in many different endodontic and microbiological literature in which we classify bacteria according to the gram staining, then gram negative bacteria appear to be the most common organism in the primary endodontic infection. Gram negative meaning that they turn the dye to red or pink. 
Many different species of gram-negative bacteria are present and bacterial species such as Dilester, Porphyromonas, Provatella and other species are present. Even though gram-negative bacteria appear to be very common, gram-positive bacterial species still exist, which includes species such as Actinomyces, Filifactor, Streptococcus and many others. So this brings us to a conclusion that obligate anaerobic gram-negative bacteria appear to be the most common bacteria in the primary endodontic infections. Still, these bacterial species that I am talking about only include a relatively smaller portion of bacterial species and a huge number of bacterial population are yet to be cultivated and characterized. So these bacterial species that are unknown and yet to be cultivated are known as bacterial phylotypes. So this was most of the information about the bacteria present in the primary endodontic infection that is documented and known as of now. Other than bacteria, fungi are also very sparsely found in the primary endodontic infections. On the other hand, viruses don't occur in necrotic pulp as viruses are those species that require living tissue in order to reproduce and metabolize and hence they have been sometimes reported to be found in vital pulps but not in necrotic pulps. So this ends our brief discussion on primary endodontic infections. Now we come to the secondary and the persistent infections. We will be discussing them together because they are more or less linked to one another. So secondary infections are those infections that are caused by microorganisms that were not present in the primary infections but were introduced in the root canal system at some time during or after a preferential intervention. So if new microorganisms are introduced into the root canal system during or after a professional intervention by a dentist, then this will be termed as a secondary anodontic infection. Hence the entry of these microorganisms that are responsible for causing the secondary infection can occur via three routes. Either during root canal treatment, which may be due to remnants of dental plaque or calculus, incomplete caries removal on the tooth by the dentist, leakage of rubber dam, contamination of instrument or not using proper irrigation protocols or something similar. Entry of bacteria can also occur between the appointments of a procedure due to maybe the loss or leakage of temporary restoration placed, fracture of tooth due to carelessness or some other reason. And finally, the entry of bacteria may even occur after the completion of root canal because after the completion of a treatment, the bacteria can enter the canal by the loss or leakage of final restoration during the preparation of post or any other intracanal restoration without using a rubber dam. It may also occur due to tooth fracture after treatment or a long delay in placing the permanent restoration or maybe due to some other cause. And because of so many reasons involved, the species of these microorganisms may be oral or non-oral in origin. Resistant infections, on the other hand, are those infections that occur from bacteria that have resisted intracanal antimicrobial procedures and managed to endure long periods of nutrition deprivation. These microorganisms responsible for causing the persistent infections are also known as persisters that have survived the disinfection process that happens during the root canal treatment and were also present in the root canal during the root canal filling or the obturation procedure. These persisters may have the ability to resist the medication that are applied during the treatment. Now in a clinical setting, both the persistent and the secondary infections are pretty much indistinguishable from one another because a dentist just cannot determine when the bacteria were introduced. These bacteria which are responsible for causing the post-treatment infection can be present from the primary infection or can also be introduced in the root canal system during the procedure. So it is practically impossible to differentiate clinically between a secondary and a persistent infection. But still, if a periapical lesion has healed after a successful treatment, then reoccurs after a certain amount of time, then this can suggest that this may be a secondary infection, but there is no confirmed way to differentiate between them clinically. Now, why do these infections occur? So, as we have discussed during primary infections, there is a huge dominance of gram-negative bacteria in those primary endodontic infections. And these gram-negative bacteria are mostly eliminated during an endodontic treatment by strong oxidizing agents because gram-negative bacteria are very sensitive to such agents which are used during an endodontic treatment. And therefore, many studies have shown a high prevalence of gram-positive bacteria in both post-instrumentation and post-medication phases. Because gram-positive bacteria have the ability to adapt to very harsh environments. These bacteria are usually present in very few numbers during the primary infections or were introduced during or after the treatment. 
The most common known species of bacteria is the Enterococcus facilis, which has been frequently found in root canal treated teeth. These bacteria are a group of facultative anaerobic gram positive bacteria, and their prevalence can range anywhere from 30 to 90 percent of the post infectious cases. These bacteria are present in way more concentration in their secondary and persistent infections as they were present in their primary infections, hence supporting the fact that gram-positive shows resistance to intra-canal medications. However, the pathogenicity of E. facilis in causing post-treatment infection has been questioned because it has also been detected in canals with no post-treatment infection with similar prevalence. Other than E. facilis, Candida albicans are also present in secondary infections. Their concentration in primary infections, just like E. facilis, is very low, but in infection of the root canal treated teeth, their concentrations can range from 3 to 8 percent. And finally, the Streptococcus group has also been frequently detected and have been shown to be involved in these secondary and persistent infections. So, this was all for intraradicular infections. Now, let's briefly go through the extraradicular infection as well. So, there are two ways an extra radical infection can occur depending on the origin or the cause of infection. One of these ways is when an extra radical infection occurs due to an intra radicular cause. So, a pical periodontitis that occurs as a result of an intra radical infection is a sort of a defense mechanism in response to an intra radical infection as it prevents bacteria from gaining access to the surrounding periradicular tissues. However, sooner or later, if the treatment of the intra radical infection is delayed, then the bacteria can overcome this defense barrier and invade the surrounding periradicular tissues and establish an extra radicular infection. There are many different types of extra radicular infection, but the most common form of extra radicular infection is the acute apical abscess. And most of the time, an acute apical abscess is mostly dependent on an intra radical cause. However, an extra radical infection can also arise without an intra radical cause. An example of such extra radical infection without an intra radical cause is apical actinomycosis caused by actinomyces and propioneum species. Although an extra radical infection without an intra radical cause is very rare, but it is an important distinction that one needs to understand. Because an extra radical infection dependent on an intra radical cause can successfully be treated via root canal treatment, while an extra radical infection independent of an intra radical cause can only be treated via an endodontic surgery. Presence of a sinus tract as a result of an endodontic infection usually indicates an extra radical involvement of the bacteria. And if a sinus closes after a successful endodontic therapy, then this confirms an extra radical infection due to an intra radical cause. So, just to clear things up, once the intraradical infection is controlled via root canal treatment or extraction and the pus surrounding the apex is drained, then the extraradical infection is easily handled by host defenses and subsides. But if the extraradical infection is not dependent on the intraradical infection, then only an endodontic surgery will be able to treat this problem. So, this was all for today's lecture in which we have discussed about different types of endodontic infections. So, I hope everything is clear in this video and all the previous three lectures on endodontic microbiology. If you still have any confusion or any questions, uh, you can comment down below and I will try my best to answer all of them. So, I will meet you people next time in my next lecture. Till then, take care of yourselves and your loved ones. Stay safe and goodbye.